Thanks. Thanks. So good afternoon. Um, so you've had your math lesson. Now it's time for your history lesson. Um, hopefully I will manage to be at least as entertaining for history as Stephen was for maths. But um, this talk is partly future focused, but a lot of it is really kind of the history of the web platform and the history of kind of the first browser war as well, uh, some of the tales from, from that, from my personal perspective, of course, because everyone has their own biases, and some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. So stay with me. Some of the lessons are probably obvious to some people, some of them maybe not so much. Um, I have been at Google now for two years. That means my non-compete agreement with Microsoft ended a year ago. Uh, so hopefully there won't be too much Microsoft bashing during my talk, but you never know what kind of mood I get in. I've also never managed a run through of this talk in under 40 minutes, so I'm gonna talk really fast. And we'll see how fast we can get through this. So this is me. Uh, when I started working on the web, uh, this is me in 1993. Uh, I was working on at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. It's the only time I'm gonna spell that out because it's impossible to say without stumbling over it. But this picture was taken at the very first web conference ever. Uh, this was the Web Wizards workshop that was hosted by O'Reilly in mid-1993. And when I was building this talk, I like having this picture at the front because it reminds me of just how much has changed in me, unfortunately, as well as, as in the web. My eight-year-old daughter was looking over my shoulder, and she said, Daddy, who's that? <clears throat> I said, well, honey, that's, that's me, you know, like nearly 20 years ago. She said, you look really different. I asked, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And she wouldn't answer me. <laughs> now, she's a smart kid, so I'm, I'm a little depressed about that. But anyhow, in 1993, um, uh, the year before, actually, this idea had come up. Uh, these guys had been looking at the software that this crazy guy in Switzerland was writing. And uh, so they built this ex-Windows program called Mosaic that accessed internet content over FTP and Gopher. And oh yeah, this weird little thing called HTTP and the World Wide Web and a weird little protocol document language called HTML. So I was in charge of the PC software development at the time. So I started putting together a team, team being me and another, and a grad student. And uh, that was kind of what happened in the next 19 years or so of my life, was NCSA Mosaic. Uh, this is. Windows Mosaic 1.0, I'm pretty sure this is 1.0, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes because not a lot changed. And by the way, to this day, whenever anyone says the word mosaic, I don't get a mental image like this. <laughs> it has poisoned me forever for that word just because it lasted for so long in my history. I always get a picture like this. Now keep in mind, like I have to set the context because I'm sadly, apparently very old now. And um, at this point in time, when you got Windows, which you know we all think we know what Windows is, I guess it's different now, but um, Windows didn't come with a network stack. Windows didn't have TCP IP built into it until Windows 95. So at this point in time, you had to go buy a separate package from a third party vendor, cost you probably more than $100 just for the software package. You had to go buy a modem, because you know, there weren't cable modems and DSL and stuff like that. And then you had to pay an ISP for dial-up service, which frequently, even you know, in the states where everything is cheap or something, it was frequently measured in dollars per minute. I mean, it was very expensive to do dial-up service. But at NCSA, uh, my first, uh, the software that I was working on in, from 1991 was PC Telnet, right, like basic terminal emulation software to connect to, to more powerful workstations. So we had a network stack, like we had a bunch of built-in network drivers. I did network driver maintenance and TCP IP code. So we ported that into Windows, we got it up and running, we got our own sockets library. And then you know, we hacked together some basic parsing and HTML rendering code. And Mosaic got up and running on Windows. And when we, we put the very first version of Windows Mosaic, which was kind of anticipated, we were running behind the X Windows and, and Mac versions. When we put it up on our FTP server, I remember in a week, we had 1,000 downloads of our software. And we thought this was amazing, like we were cheering, we threw ourselves a little party because it was so popular, it was so awesome. 
For contrast, Chrome has about 310 million active users. And when we ship a new version, when we ship an update once every six weeks or so, we convert about a quarter of our users in the first day. Like in the first day, a quarter of our users are converted to the new, the new version. That means we're doing 1,000 downloads a second, approximately. But this underscores really just why I've been so excited to be working on web browsers for so long. Every time I think I want to leave and go do something different, I end up going back into web browsing. It's because it affects so much of humanity. At its height, um, when I was working on Internet Explorer, we had about three quarters of a billion users. That's a significant portion of humanity. I mean, everyone, even people who have no access to technology whatsoever. And that's kind of amazing to have that much kind of impact on people's lives, for better or for worse, obviously. But the really, really amazing thing to me about the first version of Mosaic is 1993 was also the year that this came out. Okay, what is it? Doom, Doom thank you. Um, so we had a bunch of really high-powered PC workstations on a network connected together. We had a projection room with a big projector, that, you know, VGA connector. Nobody had these at the time. And a big stereo system. Um, yeah, I'm surprised, frankly, we got anything done. But the key here, and this ties in a little bit with Doom, but um, I've trimmed out the part that's the review of every game that I've played throughout history. Um, the key here is that we were a bunch of college students doing this. Like, I was about a year out of college, like I'd graduated about a year before, and I was in charge of the team. The team being a graduate student and a couple of undergrads, eventually, who worked on it. And we really had never done this kind of software before. Like, I remember writing the line layout code for Mosaic. I'd never written any kind of rendering code like this before. I was making it up as I went along. Now, we also, we got to build this software, even though NCSA, the division of NCSA we were part of was a software tools group. Our charter was basically make tools so that researchers can leverage the supercomputer better. Like they can get access to things on the supercomputer or uh, kind of visualize data that they get from the supercomputer super better. And this isn't really supercomputer related, per se. I mean, your supercomputer is probably not your server machine. But we had a lot of freedom to go investigate things like this. And this is, uh, even then, it was obviously an amazing tool for doing research and education. Like, you can share data more freely. This was a, a huge, amazing thing. And that kind of led me to my first lesson, which is a, an ongoing lesson. And it's kind of ebbed and flowed during the course of my career. But having this freedom to explore things that aren't kind of your core mission, your core goal, is a super important thing. Like having some flexibility in it. And this is sort of like, this ties in with, uh, with Google's 20% time, which isn't really 20% time per se, and I can discuss that in the pub later. But the idea that you can go work on things that may not be directly related to your core mission is a really super important thing. And I encourage everyone to take the opportunity, take a little bit of time, go do something that's not kind of your main mission. So you have to talk really fast, so I don't want to hyperventilate, so I gotta take a, take a drink every once in a while. Now every once in a while, there is something that you probably shouldn't take the freedom to explore. And if you read this carefully, you'll understand why this is a bad idea. Um, for some reason, as I was writing the HTML parsing code, I thought it would be neat to uh, hack away at the sanity that was the stack-based parser and now Sir Tim Berners-Lee's libw3 code in order to make it so that formatting tags could be like begin and end tags, you know, more like markup on text runs than a structure-based system. And I remember going in and showing this to Eric Bina, who is the the senior developer on the X-Windows version, and getting this look from him like, are you completely insane? And yet somehow I still had the freedom to ship this. This kind of became the standard. Um, to this day, I consider this to be my worst contribution to the world. 
and a lot of why I keep working on browsers is to atone for this and try to make up for it. And yes, even though I worked on IE for 15 years, worst contribution. So second lesson, structure might be a good idea. You might want to pay attention to, to that sort of thing. But we did have some really insightful ideas behind even the very, very early web. And again, you have to think of this in context. Because um, at NCSA, in fact, even in Sir Tim's original uh, World Wide Web concept, there was this idea that the groundbreaking thing would be that everyone could be an author. It was completely hyperlinked to different servers. It didn't really matter where the content was. Everyone could run their own web server. And this meant even in the very early days, we got this just wacky set of content. Like there was this guy named um, Kevin Hughes at the Honolulu Community College. I keep meaning to go to Honolulu just to find the Honolulu Community College because apparently they have a dinosaur museum at the Honolulu Community College. Um, and Kevin like, had a camera, he went around, took a bunch of pictures, scanned them in, created a little online exhibit that was the HCC Dinosaur Museum. And this was one of our samples, like we pointed people to this all the time. And it was totally random. I mean, this wasn't like the major dinosaur museum in the world or something. It was just sort of random that he got kind of a bug in his ear to, to put on an online exhibit. Now, keep in mind, again, the competition to the web at that point, the primary kind of online uh, content production and sharing system was Gopher. How many people have used Gopher in a significant portion? OK, fair, fair. So for the rest of you, Gopher does do hyperlinking, uh, even arbitrary hyperlinking, but it's kind of hard. It's really designed as a hierarchical content structure system. And you pay for the licenses to Gopher servers, or you, you did at least at the time. I have no idea if you still do, or if anyone's running a Gopher server anymore, for that matter. But you had to pay for it. So. Our, my university had a Gopher server. Uh, the CS department had a Gopher server. But it wasn't like I was going to go run a Gopher server. So I didn't really have access to go put content up or anything like that. But we had this idea that, you know what, we're going to put, we're going to make it so that anyone can produce content. You can link to it. You can, uh, <coughs> can get this content. The web server software should be free. So anyone can have it up, uh, can put content up. Keep in mind, firewalls, very uncommon. In fact, our office was not behind a firewall. Like, I ran a web server on my PC that was world accessible. <laughs> um, in fact, we wrote a, uh, as students, when we were working on PC Telnet, a group of friends and I wrote this network space dogfighting game called NetSpace. <laughs> and um, using the, the NCSA Telnet networking code, like I knew how to rip code and steal it, and it was open source, so it was cool. But we'd been playing, for it, playing it for a while. Like we had you know, very first LAN parties, basically. And uh, I had this little brainstorm, and I realized I'd never explicitly disabled the background FTP server code inside PC Telnet. And so sure enough, like one of my friends is playing the game, and I surreptitiously FTP into his machine <laughs> and start transferring files because, oh, by the way, we didn't actually disable that. Like it was. By default, the FTP server was on when you were connected to Telnet. Another lesson, you might want to secure that sort of thing. Don't do that. Obviously, this is well understood by this point. We've had a very, very different world occur since then. So this was all in 93, early 94. In, uh, in 1994, actually, um, NCSA the software tools group, frankly, was kind of imploding. Um, I think I was the second one to leave after Mark Andreessen. Um, and I went to a company called Spry, based in Seattle. I wanted to move to Seattle. My wife was going to grad school there. Uh, this is not the same as Spyglass. So a lot of people confuse these two. Spry made this product called Internet in a Box. Had the entire internet, one box. Take it home, you're good. <laughs> OK, not quite, but it did have everything you needed to get to the internet in one box. You actually went and bought this. It had a web browser, FTP browser, a gopher browser, uh, news browser, of course, email. And best of all, if you had a modem already, um, you could type your credit card number into the computer, and it would get you online. 
you know, for multiple dollars per minute, cha-ching. Um, but it was there. Anyhow, Spyglass is a different company. They got kind of the master license of NCSA Mosaic. They're not the same. That's all that I need to say about that. Now, I really don't need to say anything more about my time at Spry because, frankly, the main thing that I got out of my time at Spry was a real understanding of Dilbert cartoons. <laughs> so a year later, in 1995, uh, I joined Microsoft. I actually did not directly join the Internet Explorer team. I was at the company for about two months when some intern that I was working with who did work with the IE team told them that I was working there, like some guy who'd worked on browsers before. Ooh. Uh, and they came over and poached me. <laughs> this turned into a very bad scene. Um, some people got really upset when I moved over. But I joined right before we shipped IE 2.0. This is the IE 2.0 logo, by the way. It took me a while to find a copy of this. Um, I did one check-in. I don't even remember what the check-in was, but I did one check-in in IE2. And then that put me in place, so we were starting to plan what we were going to do in IE3. Like, you know, as they were locking down, finishing off the last few bugs, my manager came into my office and said, hey, uh, Netscape has this frame set feature. We want you to go do frame sets. And I was like, well, you know, that's cool and all, but there's this cool thing called cascading style sheets. Netscape is not even looking at this stuff yet. It's awesome. You get to do all this pretty stuff with your content. You can control fonts and margins and do all kinds of neat stuff. And he went off and came back half an hour later and said, OK, go ahead and do that, and we'll find somebody else to do frame sets. <laughs> so we have CSS. I'll talk a bit more about that. But the other thing that we did and that we planned to do in IE3 that was a big deal was componentization. IE3 was when we broke the browser apart so that you could use just the HTTP library part or the networking library part, or you could you know, use just the rendering part or get the whole Chrome navigation stack kind of stuff. Now, shortly before this, a little bit before this, uh, before we were doing IE3 planning, the Netscape guys went out drinking one night and <laughs> came up with this tag. If you don't know the story, uh, Lou Montulli wrote a post about it many years ago. Basically, they went out drinking. He said, oh, it would be great if we had a tag that made everything blink, as a joke, of course. And some other engineer who as yet remains unnamed, I believe, went and implemented it and checked it in. Um, you know, come up with a tag that would make the text blink. Now, note, to this day, go look at the current CSS3 text draft. And it actually, there's a, a snippet of text in there that says, conforming user agents are not required to actually blink the text for text decoration blink. That was actually my doing, um, because in CSS1, when we were doing the first round of CSS1 on the working group, I was like, OK, fine. You can have text decoration blink, but by God, we are not going to do it. So it, that has to be cool. That has to be legal. It has to go in the spec that way. And it did. So I was already trying to atone for the bold and italic thing. Um, but unfortunately, I was not the only person on the team. And some people felt that we had to do something to, that was at least as pretty as Blink. <laughs> so uh, another, another engineer, and I remember who it was, but I won't name names or anything, came up with this auto-scrolling, rotatable, blink on steroids feature. <laughs> you could control the scrolling speed. Like the, I went back and read the spec from Marquee. Um, and it's amazing. <laughs> like you can control the scrolling speed. You can control the pause when it hits the end, whether it only scrolls in one direction or bounces back and forth. And we really did manage to outblink the blink tag. <laughs> now, the, the really depressing part about this, the part that has always depressed me about the Marquee element, is that it was designed and implemented, tested, and deployed stone cold sober. <laughs> so we don't have an excuse other than somebody thought it was a good idea. I'll go back to the, you know, think about what you're doing first. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that, you know, even very quickly, you know, certainly during the IE4 cycle, um, we even looked at this and said, 
what were we thinking? You know, who did we go home with kind of thing. Um, but it turns out when we were gonna just rip it out, we couldn't because it had been adopted. Like a bunch of people had started using it and not just you know, people on early versions of MySpace, but in vertical text markets, particularly Korea for some reason, as I recall, because it let you write text in Korean that you know, showed up in the right direction and Korean users didn't have to keep bending their heads this way or the other way, I forget which it was, and, uh, or tilt their monitor, whatever. So they actually were using this. So with, with this and with CSS, I, I have to say, the lesson that I learned from this one is serendipity is actually a really powerful force. This idea that you're gonna sometimes just make desirable discoveries by accident, like you're just gonna run across it and it'll be cool. I mean, CSS is a great example. Obviously, I don't think anyone can question. CSS is a world-changing feature to the web platform. I'd mostly been drawn to it because I can make really nicely laid out pages. Like I had great topography and layout controls. Maybe not great, but certainly better than what was there before. Separating content and presentation, it was a neat idea. I mean, I didn't mind, but it wasn't really the core of what I was thinking of when I was implementing it. <coughs> now, there is of course another lesson to learn from well, all of this, which is just people like flashy stuff. Um, you know, you, you can't forget about that. In fact, I would be remiss in discussing IE3 if I didn't mention that bundled with IE3 was possibly Microsoft's finest and most impressive software package ever, aside from Microsoft Bob, of course. <sighs> Comic Chat. Does anyone remember Comic Chat? <laughs> Right on, I loved Comic Chat, I really did. I'm not being, like, I'm being only a little bit, uh, a little bit funny. Comic Chat was really cool to me because it actually layered this radically different user interface on top of an internet service. Comic Chat lets you join IRC chats with this kind of comic book interface, right? So I could actually join CSS Working Group IRC chats <laughs> and have How Can Lee show up as this dog character. And, and you know, he would, wouldn't know. It was just, <laughs> uh, I would see him, I would picture him this way. Or whoever. Um, now, realistically, this was not a great way to consume IRC chat because it, you know, the text is kind of small, it's not very compact. It would actually keep uh, popping new panels down at the bottom. But it was really, it was kind of entertaining, and at the same time, Microsoft didn't do this, let's layer something on top of an already existing and popular web service, you know, internet service. Um, that was kind of new for them, which is kind of cool. Now after IE3, we, um, here we go. We, uh, the IE4 project started, and the IE4 project was a really interesting one, and I actually want to talk about this a, a fair bit. So one of the things that people sort of understand but don't necessarily completely know all the details of is the rendering engine in IE4 was a completely separate product. It was, as someone earlier today talked about, it was a forms package. Uh, the team was originally called the forms cubed package because they were outdoing WinForms, which is a forms package in basic before the visual basic before that. But the way this came up is those of us who are already on the IE team, uh, there was about half a dozen of us working on kind of the HTML rendering and parsing engine part. And uh, we'd heard these rumors that some other team at Microsoft was working on an HTML rendering package and they were doing something with editing we didn't really know. And they started up, they set up a meeting to like introduce what they'd done and show it off to us or whatever. And uh, I had something to do, like I, I think I was babysitting a check-in or something, so I was like, oh yeah, go ahead, I don't care. Uh, and this friend of mine who was on the team, he went to this meeting and he comes back and he's just like, oh God, we're screwed. Like we're, we're out of a job, man. Like they do editing, they're all dynamic, they move stuff around. They're just miles and miles ahead of us. And I was like, okay, well that kinda, kinda sucks. But about a week later, they asked me to come present to them on CSS. 
And so I'm like, okay, fine. I'll, you know, I went in and I showed them, here's what CSS looks like, here's how it works. It's a selector concept, you get properties and you assign the properties to values. And, and you know, here's the list of properties that I've implemented. Here's the ones that I'm finishing off right now. Here's the ones that I'm, I'm hoping, because this was before we had shipped, I'm hoping to get these ones done before we ship. And I remember someone in this meeting saying, well, could you not? It's like, what are you talking about? And they were like, well, anything you ship in IE3, we have to be compatible with. And we haven't done any of the CSS stuff at all. So please stop. Now, anyone who knows me at all <laughs> knows that this is not the way to get me to stop doing something. Um, so I did, in fact, slam in a whole bunch more properties before we shipped. <laughs> and it turns out I was one of two people who were asked to move to the new rendering team, specifically to implement CSS, because they needed somebody to do it. They figured, hey, Chris has done it at least once before, um, so go for it. So I got moved into the IE4 team, the Trident team. It was renamed when they moved it into IE. And of course, the really interesting thing about IE4, and IE4 was a pretty long product cycle at that point, because previously we'd spent no more than like nine months, I think, on any version of IE. And it took about, um, about a year and a half, I think, before we, shipped, uh, before we shipped IE4. Now, there's this big thing, by the way, total side topic, about dynamic HTML, capital D HTML versus lowercase d HTML. This is actually the reason why dynamic HTML was not a branded term. Microsoft tried to make it one, but apparently we only copyrighted either the lowercase or the uppercase version, and Netscape very quickly copyrighted the other one. <laughs> And so there's never been any definition of what does DHTML really mean. It's because, you know, uh, diluted copyright, I guess. But there was this amazing thing that IE, IE4 in particular, was extremely dynamic. You could change anything. You could edit the content inside it. Like, this all seems natural now. But remember, Netscape Navigator at the time, if you resized the window, it had to reload the page. It reloaded the page from the network at this point, if you resize the page. In fact, a little bit later, uh, forget which version of, of Navigator, they finally uh, realized that this was a serious problem with forms, because if you were like typing in a form field, and you suddenly realized you needed a little more window space, and you resize the window, you just lost everything that was in your form. So they did some caching, and they would still reload the page. They would just remember what was in your form fields and fill it back out for you. Even Mosaic 1.0, by the way, could resize the window. Like, I'd, I'd, so I'd done something right. And you may wonder, by the way, why we have these weird little collections in the DOM, like document.images. Because in today's world, I really can't think of much of any use case for getting a collection of every single image that's in your document. Seems kind of goofy. The reason why it was there is because prior to IE4, in this real dynamic HTML, you basically used that to swap out image sources. It was the only thing you could do to visually change rendering, change the image source, and it would flip to a different image. It would not, by the way, resize, so you would get weird effects if your images weren't exactly the same size, but it would actually swap out the image and give you something that looked kind of dynamic. But with Trident, of course, we had inner HTML, we had an object model that could modify anything. Like it was partly parser, uh, live parser, and partly just having a live layout system that could change at any point in time. And in fact, when I was asked to join the IE, the IE4 team, they said, well, we could put you over in the, the text and rendering department, but really, we think you should join the object model team. And I remember thinking, what the hell is an object model team? And why are you putting me in the JavaScript team? Like, this didn't make sense at all because I had nothing to do with JavaScript. And it was only much later that I realized that's really, like, they were thinking of everything just goes into this object model. Something that's very natural today, but certainly wasn't at that point. So the lesson fundamentally from this, and this is a, this lesson has many deep facets to it, is simply dynamic is better than static. This holds true for user experiences as well, and applications as well. And I'm not gonna dwell on this other than to say, 
giving feedback to your users on what's going on inside your application, inside your head, is a really, really powerful thing. Anytime you can do interaction that says, yes, I understood, you clicked that button, and you want me to do something, and I'm just taking a little while to do it, you should probably do that. Now, some of you may remember, a little bit before this, uh, before IE4, um, Mark Andreessen had made this pretty famous quote that um, Netscape will reduce Windows to a set of poorly debugged device drivers. <laughs> now, I don't mean this as a cheap shot against Microsoft. I obviously didn't believe this at the time uh, because I kept working for Microsoft for 15 more years. And uh, frankly, even now, I think they're pretty well debugged device drivers. <laughs> but what I didn't really realize was how much, you know, how big an effect IE4 would have. And fundamentally, we delivered on that, even beginning with IE4 on turning Windows into a poorly, set, a poorly debugged set of device drivers. The lesson from this is, of course, you don't always get to be the one who realizes your ultimate goals of you know, taking down Microsoft. Microsoft can do it itself. <laughs> but I also want less a lesson, but more of a, a statement for people to understand. IE4 really did deserve to be super, super successful. It was very groundbreaking. We had a bunch of smart people working on it. I certainly don't agree with everything that we did or all the code we checked in or anything, but it was some pretty amazing stuff. I mean, it, it took IE from 20 or 30% to 60% browser share, but really the big deal was it was an amazing leap forward in power in what you could do on the client side and the web platform. And we really wouldn't have the web platform we have today if it wasn't for that leap forward. Now, we didn't get everything right. Some things weren't dynamic in IE4, and over the course of the next few browser releases, we did fix some of these. Uh, like in IE4, you, um, the input type, you couldn't change the type of an input element after it had been parsed. You couldn't change it from a checkbox to a radio button or something like that. It just wouldn't work. Um, and of course, we had a, lot of, a long standing set of problems with our layout system because it didn't totally match exactly what the CSS box model. Uh, complete with positioning, sizing, and floating was, frankly, because when we wrote it, there was no CSS box model that described all of those things in great detail. But this did become a problem. We started having a bunch of compatibility problems. And I remember, I think it was actually in IE 5.5, I remember uh, having to triage an issue with this fine product. This is Microsoft Cart Precision Racing. Um, not very well known even among racing enthusiasts, by the way, it was not that huge a seller for them. But like I got this issue and it was like, we'd moved to use HTML for all help files for Microsoft products and their help files were screwed up because we changed floating to work the way it was supposed to according to the spec. Thankfully, I managed to won't fix this bug. So we didn't break our compatibility for that reason. But this is where the whole doc type quirks mode thing started was we had all these weird little bugs and we didn't want to have to, um, well, Tontex certainly didn't want to have to uh, implement all of them for real web content. So from that, obviously, do it right the first time, or at least understand how you can fail and fail gracefully for the future and fix it in the future. This is probably a better lesson than just do it right, because that's kind of hard to do sometimes. Now, there were lots of other kind of serendipitous things that showed up. XML HTTP request was mentioned earlier. This was implemented in IE 5.0 uh, for Outlook Web Access because the program manager, uh, Alex Hopman, who by the way actually joined the IE team after that, um, he needed some way to get content, like get more uh, data from the server without reloading the page because they didn't want to keep reloading pages. And he was looking around for a vehicle to ship this in. And the IE team was like, we don't want to ram your code into our code. You know, go away. Like, we, we haven't even looked at this. So he discovered that he could still get it into msxml.dll, which Office shipped. And um, that's really why the XML part is at the beginning of this. Because you'll, I mean, I'm sure you know, 
most uses of XML HTTP requests are not, in fact, XML. Now, I'm not going to go through every release of IE. Um, I'm happy to go through <laughs> other releases of IE in the pub later. But um, really, we kept along this path of implementing more little features, making it a little bit better. But we didn't have a real clear end goal. Like we were all, yeah, let's build a great, powerful web platform, but we didn't really define what that meant or you know, how we were going to make money off of it, frankly. And um, that's why post IE6, we kind of refocused the team on building WPF, the .NET 3.0 platform, which was kind of take all the lessons from the web, like markup and code together is really powerful, um, and do a, a platform correctly. And some things we did super well. Like even to this day, we're only now getting grid and flow UI layouts in the web platform. Grid and flow, by the way, are like 90% of all UI is, can be easily modeled, most easily modeled with grid and flow. So I'm really excited we're finally getting this. We've caught up to WPF of 10 years ago. So have clear goals. Uh, I sometimes call this my be careful what you optimize for because everything has side effects. So about this time, this is 2000, 2001, uh, John Alsop had this great statement that was really design focused, but um, I tend to expand this to all of the web platform and development about it's time for the medium of the web to, to basically to stop being like a weird printed page and at the same time to stop being a weird runtime as well. And part of that was tied together with the fact that at this point in time, we started seeing all these mashup applications particularly as we got later and later and towards 2004 in there. So we started seeing all these apps that they weren't one piece. They were like a mapping component from over here and a database of crimes in, by neighborhood over here. And you get this powerful application that lets you visualize things because you can mash these multiple components up in the same platform. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about the web platform to me is that it's not you go and get one component and then you, you know, pull, it in, pull its package in and you get your data and you have to pull it in. It's like you can sort of federate that out to different pieces. It, a lot of people in Microsoft at this time were saying, you know, the web is powerful because it's a great reach platform. This, there was no better way to piss me off. Because to me, it was really the powerful thing was combining all of these data sources and component sources from the web rather than having to write the code myself. If I had to write a mapping component, I would give up. I would go you know, find something else to do. So then we did IE7, um, finally realized we needed another browser, uh, applied the paddles, you know, yelled clear, all that kind of stuff. Um, I actually am really proud of IE7 just because we started from zero to get it going. Uh, not that it was great technically, but that's the last direct reference to IE I'm going to make. Um, you're free to ask me to dig into more of it in the pub later. But this time period from like 2000 to 2008 was really critically important for computing and the web because it was the advent of Web 2.0. And this is the best description I've ever heard that captured what Web 2.0 was to me. It was caring about your user experience. Like focus on the user experience, not on the technology, not on how you're putting <coughs> things together, not on the data that you're using. Focus on the user experience. And that's been a core lesson that I've taken from there. In fact, if you look at mobile, which has come an immensely long way in a short period of time, in, when the iPhone was released, I used one of these. Um, it had a web browser, it had email, calendar, contacts, all the stuff synced over the, uh, over the air. Um, I could check the traffic, which, huge thing, uh, for those of you who live in Seattle and had to commute across a bridge. But the iPhone came out and it was just groundbreaking. It was amazing because it had these really engaged experiences. You were like, you were touching it and you were, you know, tilting it and it did all these weird things. In 10 years, I went from having one of these bad boys to being able to hold my phone up in the air, have it tell me what music I was listening to or get a map anywhere in the world or hold my personal favorite, hold my phone up in the air and have it tell me what constellations I'm looking at. 
so I can stop making up constellation names when I'm telling my daughter that's the princess and that's the donkey. <laughs> and I don't have to pull out a compass and a watch and a protractor and figure it out. So now, to me, it's basically about battery life. Uh, I said a couple years ago, my cell phone has to be a guitar tuner because I don't ever want to carry a guitar tuner ever again. I can get that as a native app anywhere. I actually can now get it as a web app because we have audio input now. Um, I actually did a, a tuner app as well. Craig Spence's is way, way better and way prettier. But if you look at this, why this didn't cause an immediate mobile expansion, it was really because you didn't have any access to that stuff in the web platform. Right? You couldn't grab uh, touch and the accelerometer and all these other pieces from the web platform on the iPhone at the time. And of course, discoverability was pretty hard. But if you look at where we are today, you actually can get these things. We have 2D and 3D graphics that are really powerful. We have storage APIs, geolocation. You can kind of hook into the native OS experience, but we have audio and video I.O., as, as Paul showed you earlier. We have great touch APIs. Uh, one of my kind of seminal apps has always been my dive computer. Whether I'm going to be able to just clip the leads on my dive computer and have it download my dives directly into the web platform, and actually, with the serial APIs, I can now do that. Like I'm, it's on my list to write this code in about a month when I get some time. And that really has taught me my final, next to final lesson, which is integrating all these pieces in the real world is absolutely critical to building compelling user experiences. It's not about one thing that's sitting out there. It's not about, can I store files on the local system? It's, can I drag and drop files into my application seamlessly and not really think about you know, where they're coming from or how to come up with a URL for a local file? In fact, I will very briefly roll back to a long, way, a long time ago, IE 1.0, before I actually even joined Microsoft. IE 1.0 was based on Spyglass Mosaic. They did two things to Spyglass Mosaic before they shipped it. One of them, of course, was branding. They changed the name to Microsoft Internet Explorer. Um, the other one was this feature called Internet Shortcut. It was basically a symbolic link to a website from an icon on your desktop. Seems totally basic today. No one had this at the time. Like, Mosaic didn't do this. You know, Netscape didn't do this. No one did this. There was no way to make a link to a website as an icon on your desktop. And I think that integration was actually a very prescient thing very early on. So with that, I got to say, you know, I would have loved to have spent 40 minutes playing with web audio up on stage, because that's the technology that I'm super excited about. But I don't want to, I wanted to talk about history instead. And I think the number one thing that I would encourage everyone, that I always, always encourage everyone, is as you build experiences, make them really magical. Make them something that people get super excited to sit down and play with and explore and learn new things about. And with that, I'm done.